I spent 27 years in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Eight witnesses cleared me this crime in a confession. And the justice system turned a blind eye to this evidence because they did not want to admit that they made a mistake or that it was intentional by the prosecutor who handled this case. So a lot of politics kept me in prison and this happens often. Hi, my friends. It's Rob. Welcome back to my channel. Really quick, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. I have headphones in because I'm filming on my phone really quick. And a few people have said that my videos that I film on my phone recently have been really low. And then when the commercials and the intro comes in, it's like blaring loud. I apologize. When I edit, I use headphones, so it's all the same sound to me, so I didn't even know there was any discrepancy. Hopefully this will resolve the issue. If not, I will practice with my headphones on my computer. And the only reason I'm on my phone right now is because I was literally in the process of getting dressed to go outside and work out, and I remembered I needed to shoot the intro for this video, so that's why you're getting workout row. But I want to get this done as soon as possible because this is so exciting. So we have an interview with Valentino Dixon, a man who did close to 30 years in New York State prison for a crime that not only he didn't commit, there were over nine, I think, witness testimonies that proved that he wasn't there and they were overlooked. And he spent almost three decades still trying to prove his innocence and get himself out which he wound up doing he wound up getting himself basically celebrity status he's been super successful in the short time he's been out he's about to have a hit tv show and we'll put that all in the interview here's the thing this is the cool part of this is i was not the person who conducted this interview because my very dear friend kat who's been on the channel before she goes by the name mrs b she she is good friends with Valentino. They went to school together. So it was a no-brainer that she would interview him over me interviewing him because they know each other. They have history and a friendship together. And she was an integral part of getting his story out at the family conference when he first got out. She told anybody that would listen. She's a huge supporter of his. So without wasting any more time, here is Valentino Dixon's story and an interview with my dear friend Kat, Mrs. B. Hi guys, it's admin Kat and I have a special treat for you. With us is my classmate and dear friend Valentino Dixon. I'm going to let him tell you his story. We're going to go right into this and start with some questions that we came up with. So Valentino, welcome and on behalf of Strong Prison Wives, I want to thank you for your time because I know how super, super busy you are and I got to say, man, what have you been out, like a year and a half now? Yeah, about, about a year and uh, eight months. Okay, so in that year and eight months, I have seen you walk out of that jail, walk out of that courthouse. You have accomplished so much in that year and eight months that it kind of, I'm kind of in awe of you, and it kind of makes me say, what the hell could he have done in 27 years if he would have been home? Let's get into it, and we'll start with the first question. Tell me about yourself, your story. Where are you from? How long did you do and how long? Well, we're not going to go into the last question because you already answered it. How long have you been home? All right. Well, I spent 27 years in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Uh, me and you went to school together and we took art together. And so while in prison, I realized that if I was ever going to see the lighter day, I would have to draw myself out of prison. Eight witnesses cleared me this crime in a confession. And the justice system turned a blind eye to this evidence because they did not want to admit that they made a mistake or that it was intentional by the prosecutor who handled this case. So a lot of politics kept me in prison. And this happens often where you see people being released after 10, 20, 30 years when the evidence existed this whole entire time. So I drew up to 10 hours a day, Catherine. Oh, and, I believe it. Right. And I started to get national attention while I was in prison. And one day the warden comes by and he has, hey, Valentino, would you draw my favorite golf hole? Because I was known as the, the artist in the Attica. And I said, yeah, sure, why not? I never golfed before. I'm a black kid from the inner city. 
You know, so you know golf is not something that we do. <laughs> right? You already know that. So I draw this golf course for him, the 12th hole of Augusta. He loves it. I give it to him. He retires shortly thereafter. One of the other inmates said, hey, Valentin, you need to draw some more golf holes. I'm like, get out of here. I'm not drawing no golf holes. What are you talking about? He brought some old Golf Digest magazines. Before I knew it, I started drawing golf courses every day, which led to me sending one of the drawings in a four-page letter to the Golf Digest magazine, which led to them coming to the prison, interviewing me in July 2012 which led to a Golf Channel interview, which was nominated for an Emmy Award in 2014. However, I still remained in prison until Georgetown came three years later and decided to take my case. And they did an investigation. More evidence was uncovered that the prosecutor withheld physical evidence that cleared me to crime. When I was arrested, they took my clothes and they took my car. And they tested to see if I fired a weapon. And, and when it came back negative, this prosecutor withheld the results. Yes. And the students was able to uncover this. And ultimately, I was released September 19, 2018. Since then, I've used my voice to travel all around the world and to educate people, to inform them on our system and how we can make the system more fair, just, and equal for all peoples, you know, not just blacks, whites, you know, Hispanics, everyone. Because our sentencing laws are some of the hardest sentencing laws in the world. You know, it violates the Eighth, uh, the eighth Amendment to the Constitution. It gives cruel and unusual punishment. And I just visited a guy that has 47 years on, on a 20-year sentence. Imagine that. And this is the reason why we have over 2.4 million people that's locked up in prison is because they're not releasing anybody, you know? And so I just use this time and the platform that I've been given by God to spread this message because without the American people really understanding and getting on board, then the system is never gonna change. On top of that, I've had some art shows in some of the biggest galleries around the world. I met Tiger Woods. I told him he was going to win the Masters before yes, he did. won it last year. I came up with an idea to have a drawing show called Draw and Talk With Me, where I teach people how to draw of all different professions. I got an NFL football player, Hall of Fame golfer, a woman who dated Donald Trump, you know, Major League Baseball players, a heart doctor at John Hopkins Hospital, a police officer. 20 people that has Parkinson's disease. I teach all of these people how to draw because they don't believe they have the talent. And it's my job to bring that out of them. And then we discuss real life issues. We talk about prison reform. We talk about social justice. We talk about overcoming challenges, you know, because that's a big thing with people in the world now is that, you know, people don't know where to turn to when they find themselves in difficult situations. So I'm the guy that's going to tell you that I, I survived a six by eight prison cell for 27 years, and you too can survive anything mm -hmm. that life throws at you. Right. You know, so I just try to motivate people. I try to inform them. I've been given a gold medal from the Vatican Church, and I also was nominated for an Emmy Award again, and I went to the Emmys last year. It's been wonderful. It's been a lot of work. I still write inmates every week. I accept their phone calls. Too. I visit them. Yep. You know, I have a, such a busy schedule, but I find time to do these things. And that's amazing. That's amazing. Thanks. With me, I tell people the story that we're in, and they look at me and they go, oh, stop. That's, that's, that's an episode of Law & Order. What are you talking about? Right. Or I tell them what our founder from SPWF, what her husband's going through, serving 213 years and he never hurt anybody because he had a gun and it happened, you know, and all this. So I love that you took this talent that we had, which by the way, let's make it known when we went to performing arts, you didn't do that. You know what I mean? We had to fight for our talent back then to go to that school. And I love that you did that. And I love that you're doing this. And that's why I'm in such awe of you because, again, you've accomplished so much in that year, in eight months, 
that it just proves that, you know, the second chances really do mean something. And when you have something that's got that fire inside of you, you're drawing. It's amazing. Let's go to the next question. What, and I think I already know the answer to this because I've been following you since the day you came home. What are some of the unexpected obstacles that you've encountered coming home? Well, I haven't, I'm different. Okay. Right. I haven't, you are. You're exceptional. I haven't experienced, right. I haven't really experienced obstacles because I did my research before I came out. Yeah, you kept All up right. And stuff. this is very important for the guy leaving prison. He needs to talk to as many people as possible because guys come in and out of prison as a rotating door. So I would ask guys and pick their brains like, how did you end back up in prison? You just did five years and now you're right back. Okay, so I got all of these stories that I listened to and I took all this knowledge in, you know, and I just said to myself, you know, you can't allow none of these things to happen to you. So I was prepared when I got out, I knew what to expect. I knew what type of phone I wanted, you know, all of these things, 27 years, you can get stuck in time if you're not careful. So I made it my business to educate myself, read hundreds of books, pick everybody's brains, pay attention. I don't care if we was watching TV in the prison lobby, you know, I'm paying attention to a commercial. I'm paying attention to everything that comes on the screen because I have to. And if I don't, I'm not going to know what's going on in society. So I can tell you that I was just so grateful to have my freedom that any obstacle that come before me was like, I could overcome it in my sleep. You know, because the hard part is over with. But everybody don't have that type of fortune as I have. Okay, a lot of guys walk out and they don't have a support base. I had a support base. They don't have the level of education that I gave myself in prison. And it's very hard for them. I've, you know, been contacted by guys who was released that didn't have clothes, where I had to go buy them clothes and sneakers, who didn't have $5 in their pocket didn't have a place to stay. I'm speaking from my perspective, but I can tell you that my perspective is not no. normal. No, I remember when, we, when you were doing the uh, bird shield, somebody asked you how you kept your light going. You didn't get that dark place. And again, another reason to be in complete awe of you. If you had to do it all over again and you were being released today, what would you do differently if you would do anything differently? Well. I'm a very giving person, very, very giving, you know, and I had a business plan and I love to give and help everybody. I gave away a little bit too much money to family and friends when I came <laughs> home and they should have been giving me money. So I would do that a little differently. I wouldn't give them as much as I did. You always had a big heart. You always had a big uh, heart, Valentino. You know? Always had a big heart. Going back a little further, what? might you have done differently while still being in prison knowing the challenges once released but i don't think you really had any well let me say this i wasted my i think the first seven years i kind of wasted away i did my time like a lot of other people i wasn't productive all right i didn't get productive till maybe the eighth year so okay. my last 20 years was productive had i know what i know now i would have went right to work you know, okay. my appeals were denied and denied and denied, and I didn't know much about the law. I didn't start learning about the law until about 10 years into my incarceration, okay? I would have immediately, you know, started reading the law books and going to the law library, and I would have saved a lot of money because I had nine lawyers in 27 years, you know? Yeah, and these guys sucked the life out of me, my family, and my supporters, and it wasn't until I started studying and understanding what's going on here that I was able to sit in front of any lawyer and basically go toe to toe with them. If they wanted to play uh, legal games with me. I mean, that's what it took. I had, I, had to, I, had to, I had to be whatever it is I needed to be in order to get my freedom. I had to be a lawyer. I had to be a psychologist. Uh, you had to be, I had to be a master artist. You yeah. know, I had to be a great speaker. You know, I started speaking to the prisoners about choices, you know, and I never was the type of guy that was going to get before people and speak. You kidding me? I'm afraid of that. I had to overcome those fears. For me, it was life or death. I didn't have a choice. 
you either become this person that you need to be, or you may die in the prison cell. Because you were in Attica and you were in just I was in I was in Wendy for a year. Wendy. I was in I was in Clinton for a year and I was in Attica for 25 years. Yeah. Imagine that surviving Attica 25 years. And let me say this. And not coming out like really like damaged like you know what i'm saying yeah, exactly like that's that's yeah, what i, I like, refuse to allow that to happen i yeah. seen how people were damaged in prison because of the long-term confinement solitary confinement and it really really messed with people's psychological way of how they see things in life we hear it every day especially now in these challenging times they're letting guys come home and our members are telling us, I, I don't know what to do. And they're coming to me because I'm really the only one that has somebody who came home. And we're so fortunate. I mean, he only did four years. He did the same thing you did. He had a goal. He worked on that goal. We got the business going. What you've been through is just amazing. And I remember the day you got arrested. I remember seeing your name. We graduated in 1989 and you got arrested, what, 91? Yep. Yep. 91. And I remember I saw it on TV and I was like, what? What? Let me tell you something. That's the, let me tell you something. Murder, you know me. No That's way. the worst thing on the planet that they could accuse me of is murder. No, I that said that. Like, that hurt me so hard to my soul. Yeah, and I said that. I said, something doesn't jive here. Something's wrong. Because you didn't have the heart for that. Never. We're not going to get into your fashion, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to do that to you. You were fly, though. That's I'm right. using more fly, and you were ahead of your time. But right. you kind of like uh, were out there, but you weren't out there. Right. You know I mean? And for that, it just. Blew. And you know me. I was always respectful. Oh, never absolutely. Never a troublemaker. You never were, you never, were never bothered never nobody. Loud, like some of the people you, know you hung out I with. I always had this smile. Right. Yeah, always. And here's the thing like, when you got released, and then I started hearing all the stuff. I was like, wait a second. I was like the other person that would come to me and go, this didn't happen. This is a law and order. Episode. You know what I mean? Like, it was just insane. We're going to move a little forward. What experience did you have in prison that most benefited you while transitioning home? I don't know if it was one thing. It was a combination of things. I think that I prepared for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I prepared as if I was going home tomorrow every day the last 20 years, you know, so I can't think of one particular thing that helped me the most during my transition. Everybody takes a different course. For me, it was study. It was paying That's attention to nice. the world. How do I make myself happy when I get out? What kind of life I'm going to live? And this does not just apply to me, it applies to everybody because all of us are going to be tested in life. My test was 27 years. You know, I have friends in prison who committed suicide because they could not pass the test. And they only had a year to go home, that type of thing. So the mind is very fragile. But my point is, is that even right now with the coronavirus, okay, this is a quarantine for most people. A lot of people is, you know, just out there and they doing whatever they want to do. But for most people who are taking this serious, this is like a quarantine that they've never experienced ever in life, okay? And they can walk around the house, you know, whereas I had a six by eight cell for 27 years. That's a quarantine beyond quarantine. I don't like to harp a lot into, oh, I'm this victim of this and this and this and this. No, I'm gonna say that everything happens for a reason. And if I had to spend 27 years in prison to, to come out with my and use my voice to help change the world in some small, significant way, right. then this is what it had to be. That's how I feel about our situation. I feel like I was put on this path to help people. And also it rekindled my art too, because now I'm, you know, the executive designer of everything that the organization does. So for that, I'm also grateful. Um, and I don't like to play the victim either. And I think it goes back to us going to the school that we went to at the time that we went to because I was a freak in my neighborhood. I was in North Buffalo with all the guidos. You know what I'm saying? You were, 
doing other stuff. And I had a father who was a hairdresser. Like, that was even worse. Let me ask you, what was the single most valuable resource that you had access to during your transition? I met a guy that helped me get healthcare and dental who has spent 37 years in prison himself. So I really needed that. Outside of that right there, I haven't taken any type of therapy less, you know, classes with anybody or, or sessions, but I put it that way. I just do a lot of praying. I stay focused on the goal. I think life is too short. You know, you got to figure this stuff out quick. Right. You know? And even now, people are going to have to try to figure out how their lives is going to be after this, what they're going to do different. Because life is never going to be the same for us. No. Nope. All right. So you have to, instead of being a victim of this, the goal is to be victorious and come out of this stronger. Wow, this made me stronger. Right. This two or three months inside allowed me to discover things about myself, allowed me to stop procrastinating, where I started doing so many things that I have procrastinated about because now I have the time to do it. That's awesome. What essential resource was missing during your transition? Well, once again, nothing. Because the you foundation was already laid out for me. Okay? But, once again, I'm going to speak for the person that does not have that foundation. The person that's walking out of prison, that needs a job, that needs shelter, that needs clothing, that needs a support base that needs counseling, okay? I'm gonna speak for that person right now because for me to say anything, it would be untrue. Everything that I needed was there for me, mm -hmm. okay? But that is not the norm. People really come out of here, out of a prison system to, into nothing. They also get discriminated against when trying to look for a job. There's a book that's out that it highlights 10,000 uh, challenges for a person with a felony to get a job. And I wouldn't say it's 10,000, but it's a lot of obstacles and a lot of challenges that a person goes through in order to make themselves a productive citizen society. It's so hard. Some guys take, it takes them years to achieve anything or to get accepted back into the normal acceptance. Even guys on parole, some of their parole officers won't allow them to get a driver's license. Right, yeah. You know, but the guy has to go to work, or a woman has to go to work. And our state is one of the highest states that violates, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because it's, it, the thing is, is this. It's a lot of money involved, right? you know, for a certain class of people. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest here. And it's become prioritized. It's a private thing. You know what I'm saying? Whereas the private companies is getting involved now. And there's investments. There's job opportunities. Okay. And this is why the prison population has not dwindled down. Right. Because a lot of people will get laid off. Right. Okay? And this is where the politics come in part. Right. Here. That was another reason why I loved seeing you at Birchfield. Because you had that class, that audience there that knows nothing of what's going on. Right. And that was exceptional that you had that audience. I am stoked about your show. I can't wait. I've been watching your lives. I love what you're doing with the lives. That's awesome. We're going to share, share, share. Well, let me ask you something. Have you seen the 20 episodes that I put up there with my guests? Because that that's one. the show right there. Right. Growing the Talk With Me With My Guests is the show. The lives was just something that right, I did that you while did we after, were in quarantine. Right. That got right behind you. Isn't that the one of the originals? Yeah, this is an original. This is an Augusta. That's the one. The 12 hole of Augusta. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one that made you, yep. Absolutely. And this is a 20 by 30. Love it. And you got there, right? You actually played? I went here. Yes, you I, did. We're Tiger won last year. Uh, and you told him, and he called you and said, thank you, did he not? And I, and he, no, I said, look, Tiger, you're going to win. He said, I'm going to yep. try my best. He said, I said, no, you're going to win. Love it. All right, oh, I love and I, you. And I just came out in this month's issue of Golf Digest magazine oh. where I drew a picture of Tiger. Nice. And I put a shirt on him with this hole right here. <laughs> That's Hold awesome. on, let me go get it right quick. Hold on, I'm okay. going to get it right quick. Hold on one All second. Right. So here's the cover of this month's issue, April. Love See? It. 
So they asked me, they said, we want you to draw this picture of Tiger, but we want you to do it in your own artistic way. Right? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to show you the picture and then I'm going to show you our article because we got an article about how I told him he was going to win the Masters. All right. A lot of people don't know about this. So here's uh -huh. the drawing that I did. So here's their picture. All right. And here's my drawing. And there's Valentino. Love it. Yes. Oh, that is so cool. You did his shirt in your, that's awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. I and here's love the it. article. So check it out. It's April I issue. will definitely check it out. Okay, awesome. Thank you. God bless you, Valentino. Thank love you, you for too. everything. We're going to do a part two to this. Yes, absolutely. All right. Okay, Looking cool. Looking forward to All right, it. Love Thank you. you. Love you. All Stay right. safe. Okay, I will. All right, bye-bye. Bye, honey. What an incredible story. Make sure you go follow Valentino on social media. You guys keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to it all being behind you. Lots of love from my heart, Kat and Valentino's hearts to all of yours. I'll see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one.